morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to today's webinar on how to build the ultimate GL in Dynamics GP. My name is John Smith. I'm Director of Enterprise Business Solutions here at CR Group, and I have been uh, working with Dynamics GP since 2001, I think going back to, to version 6. I've been involved in a lot of implementations. I have seen many, many, many uh, COA and uh, G general ledger structures over the years. Uh, we've done lots of GL cleanup exercises. So sort of bring that background to today's presentation and hope you get some value out of it. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation is being recorded and it will be sent out to you. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, I'd encourage just to go ahead and enter them into the question panel. Uh, in the GoToWebinar panel, there's a question area, and I'll, I'll get to any of the questions that come in at the end of the presentation today. It is only a 30-minute webinar, uh, but we will have time to, to deal with any questions that come up. As well, we're making sure that any of these professional development items we do qualify for professional hours, so uh, following this, you will get a certificate in your uh, email. Uh, confirming that you attended and, and that you're eligible to use that. I know it's all evidence-based now, so if you're like me, you need to, you need to have something to prove that you uh, went through the professional development piece. Also, stay tuned. At the end of the webinar today, we're going to do a draw for a $50 Amazon gift card. So without further ado, I think we'll go ahead and just get started. And really what we want to talk about today is, is the structure, obviously, of the chart of accounts, the general ledger, this whole important piece in Dynamics GP. And, you know, we usually start this by looking at, you know, what are the reasons why you would want to even consider making a change? And, you know, most of the time we see, we see things coming from this first bullet, which is really just about improving financial and management reporting. Often the structure that's in place just doesn't meet the requirements. And truthfully, you know, when we think about financial reporting in this system, you know, all paths lead back to the general ledger, and, and that is our core source of financial reporting data. So it does need to be structured to facilitate that. Uh, as well, you know, oftentimes if we've got multiple entities, we might want consistency across multiple entities and maybe it's not consistent now. It's another reason to make a change. Uh, consolidation issues and intercompany transactions come up from time to time. This is another big one, often assistance in budgeting and planning. If you have a budgeting platform, if you're looking to integrate a budgeting technology, or if you're doing it through Excel, uh, you know that that chart of accounts, again, is core and central uh, you know, to really you know, holding at least the budget ID in Dynamics GP. So that could be another good reason to look at cleaning up the structure. Uh, this one comes up all the time, you know, this, that, that the chart of accounts is just growing and growing and growing and growing. And we're going to come back to this later in the presentation. You know, if your chart of accounts is growing exponentially, I'm going to say you've got too many segments in there or there's something wrong with the detail level that you're tracking in there because you shouldn't have an exponentially growing chart of accounts. There's a few unique situations I've seen over the years where there was no way around it, but truthfully speaking, there are capabilities within Dynamics GP to avoid that. And Truthfully, oftentimes when we do the GL restructures, that's one of the things that's going on. It's, it's usually that, you know, this chart of accounts has just exploded. It's tough to do reporting. Everything seems all over the place. And holy, holy, we've got way too many GL accounts. Um, so we're going to talk about some tools later in the presentation to help you fix that and help you clean that up. And, you know, integration. There's another good reason to look at, to look at changing up the COA. You know now, too, that uh, that Dynamics GP has a journal entry copy-paste feature. So, you know, just making sure the GL and the COA is clean is going to help with, with all of these items that we're mentioning here. Organization structure. Hmm. Somebody tells me, often clients tell me every time they do a budget, their org structure changes. And when their org structure changes, they need the COA to accommodate that. And again, that's probably one of the big reasons to change. So I look at this slide and think, improve financial management reporting, reduce the total number of GL accounts, and org structure has changed. To me, those are the three big drivers of why we look at changing up the COA. Some principles we think are important when we look at changing it. And the first one is consistency. We want to make sure that uh, all the information across all the business units and all the entities is consistent. And, you know, we talk about different entities having the same structure. That's about easing consolidation. 
Uh, we want to make sure it's easy to do reports that compare, contrast, and benchmark between uh, different organizational units. You know, on, off, uh, this is important too, reducing the learning curve on how you use the chart of accounts, you know, how the accounts are sequenced and grouped and where to find them. Um, that can be an important principle to think about when we restructure. Spending less time on reconciliation issues and building flexibility to allow for growth you know, without, without sacrificing sort of current transaction efficiency. So what we mean there is we've got to think about the future of the business and make sure we leave, you know, probably enough number sequences between, you know, the numbers in an individual segment to allow for growth. I'm not advocating here that we put, you know, four or five uh, segment structures together and use only three and have two sitting there blank just waiting for us to use one day. I don't really believe that to be something you need to do, but I do think you need to think about the number of digits within the segments, um, you know, to allow for growth and you need to think about sequencing and numbering and we're going to come back to that in a little, a little point here in the presentation. But needless to say, these are important principles to think about when we're restructuring the GL. Uh, we said this right at the start, right? Enterprise reporting and analytics is the most important component of our thinking process. What we're trying to get out of the chart of accounts is stable, reliable financial and management reporting. And oftentimes the mistake that's being made at client sites is that we're so hyper-focused on the GL as that financial and management reporting piece, we load it up with everything we think we'll ever need to report on. And, and I find oftentimes I'm, I'm doing this thing called a paradigm shift when we're doing sales presentations and demos where we're talking about, you know, this big ERP system has a lot of capability to drive reporting and analytics from the subledgers. The subledgers are rich with information. So if you think about, for instance, a sales subledger, right, in sales order processing in GP, you've got all the invoice history, you've got customers there, you've got the salesperson that sold them, you've got the products that are on the invoice. So when we look over to the GL, you know, we don't necessarily need to replicate all of that, right? And, and we often find sometimes that customers are doing that, that they're bringing over stuff into the GL that's already sitting there in the subledger. And I think it's really important here not to overburden the GL um, just because you've got this nice management reporter tool, it doesn't really mean everything has to be in the GL. So we want the GL to be focused on financial and management reporting, and I'm going to define that as saying, you know, these are the financial statements, these are sort of the management reports that compare actuals to budget and do variances, right? And as soon as we start getting into top 10 customers and, you know, trending product sales and, uh, you know, detail of sales by salesperson, those types of items can come out of the sales order processing subledger. You can run smart lists, you've got uh, uh, analysis cubes you can run that get to that information really easily. So, again, part of this, let's just focus on what we need that GL to be. So, the structure is important in GP. And, you know, this is also interesting from a GP perspective. Uh, GP is probably one of the last remaining ERPs out there that has this multi-dimensional segment structure in place. You can have up to 10 hard-coded segments in the GL structure. We said yikes here on the slide uh, for good reason. We have worked with a client who went to 10, um, and that's a maximum of 66 characters in those 10 segments. Uh, that customer found they could live with that structure for, oh, about nine months before uh, it was just driving everybody crazy. But, you see, when we look at the information stored in the GL, it's not just the segments that are the place we store them. We also have the account categories, the user-defined fields, and analytical accounting dimensions. So I want to talk about these just a little bit. Uh, you, go, you know probably the COA setup right off the back of your um, uh, back of the napkin approach of looking at it and knowing it and going through it. This, this COA is straightforward. Uh, we have a multi-segment approach. You see the segments inside GP when you go into it. As soon as you go to put a transaction in, you know, you got to type out the segments. Is there a best practice on the segments? It really, you know, I, I don't want to put a number out there and say you should only have a certain number of segments, but I will say that when you get beyond six segments, it gets really difficult. And I will say that the majority of clients we've worked with, and that's in the range of hundreds, uh, have three or four segments. And, you know, when you look at those three or four segments, you know, 
two of them are always going to be, first of all, the natural or main account segment. Usually there's a department or a business unit segment in there as well. So right away then you're saying, well, beyond sort of a natural and a department segment, what other ones would I have? And that sort of gets specific to the organization or the business. Analytical accounting is also an important piece in GP, and it's oftentimes overlooked. You know that analytical accounting gives us the capability to create unlimited tracking dimensions above and beyond what is in the GL segments. And those analytical accounting dimensions can be, um, you know, alphanumeric. So what we're looking at now, just lists of things like employee lists, project lists. It could be trade show lists. And the advantage of analytical accounting is that you can say inside GP that on certain GL accounts, these analytical accounting dimensions or some of these analytical accounting dimensions are required. So we might say when someone posts a debit to uh, the travel accounting, the travel account, uh, we want to know the employee name who traveled. So we can say on the travel account, you know, employee name is required and employee name is the AA code. We might say, gee, we have a marketing trade show uh, GL account. So whenever we use the trade show account, you have to put in an analytical accounting dimension of what trade show it was. Analytical accounting is very interesting in a few other ways. Um, one of the things that it really offers us is the capability to change what we want to look at or what we need to track over time without burdening the underlying hard-coded GL structure. So I do see a lot of clients when they have big complicated COA structures sort of refining them and tra starting to track some of this stuff in analytical accounting rather than creating hard-coded segments for it. And I think that's one of the important principles here. When we look at restructuring the GL, in this day and age using GP, you must consider whether analytical accounting has a role for your organization. Management Reporter looks at analytical accounting and hard-coded GL segments and the account category and the user-defined fields on the, account, on the account setup card all as equals. Like to Management Reporter, these are all just financial dimensions. It doesn't care from a financial reporting perspective if the segment or the underlying data is stored in a hard-coded GL segment, if it's stored in a user-defined field on the account card, if it's stored in analytical accounting, if it's an account category. Look, it gives you the options. It treats them all as equals. Once it pulls the data out, it's truly sitting there saying, you pick and choose what you want to look at and how you want to base your report. And this is really the essence of this multi-dimensional financial reporting structure. It's a really, really good structure in GP. It's sort of option city here to say, hey, look at all these options we have, right? And that's why, again, if the tendency has been just to use the hard-coded segments, it, it's not the correct approach. It's one that you need to really look at. And when you consider, hey, how do we want to store this stuff in GP going forward, this is a good slide to look at because it just shows you right there there's lots of different ways to do it. And that really comes back to the key consideration here. What's the right blend? You know, if we've got analytical accounting, we've got categories, we've got hard-coded segments, what do we do? And the core comes down to when you make this decision, what do you put in the chart of accounts as hard-coded structures, and what do you put in analytical accounting? And our recommendation to our clients and our thought process that we use, I'd say 95% of the time, there's always an exception. But you know, our thought process here is that the chart of accounts segments should hold repeatable, um, repeatable financial dimensions that are used for financial reporting needs. So the key is that they're not short-term in nature, that those dimensions are going to stick for some time. So we've mentioned two already. We talk about the main account segment, and potentially a department or division. When we look at the organization, we'd say the business may change, the products may change, but they'll always have a natural account segment, and they'll always have a department structure. So to me, those were no-brainers that we put in the hard-coded chart of accounts. When we think of things that are short-term in nature, we look to analytical accounting for those. And analytical accounting is really 
could be things that could be like things like project. It could be things like trade show. You know, these things that have limited amounts of time. If I'm doing a three-month project, I don't want to create a series of GL accounts so that I can track the expenses and revenue related to a three-month project. Because once that project is over, I'll be stuck with those accounts. You know that once you've put history into an account, you can't delete it. So why would I do that? I also think, again, things that are short-term in nature. For instance, for us, we do a fair number of trade shows. Well, if we're going to track our spend on a trade show, we're not going to create GL accounts for every trade show we go to. My goodness, three days at the trade show and it's over and we're never going to it again. So, you know, I just want it in a list that I can track expenses against and then you know, once it's over, I'm going to inactivate that item. I'll still be able to report on it. It's a perfect fit for analytical accounting. So once we've made the distinction between what goes into the chart of accounts hard-coded segment and what goes into analytical accounting, then we're going to talk about structuring the segments, right? And, you know, we, don't, we didn't really come up with this. This is just sort of common logic. Um, but I am surprised when we go meet new clients, when they've done implementations, I'm often surprised that this hasn't always been thought through. And this is just a straightforward way of logically ordering the natural accounts. So it follows, you know, recommended accounting policies that would say you drain the accounts in liquidity order, your assets are in the 1000 series and you know your non-operating items like foreign exchange gains and losses and gains and losses on disposal of fixed assets and stuff are way down in the 8000 series. Um, the idea though is that it's common that you know when when we show somebody who joins our finance team the account structure, we can say, look, all the assets are in 1,000, the liabilities 2,000, the 3,000s are equities, the 4,000s are revenue, the 5,000s are cost of goods sold. We've always used this when we do new implementations of GP, and it works. It works really well. Understanding that logic right there, right on that screen, makes training someone on management reporter much, much easier, okay? And it's going to make your management reporter reports much easier to develop and much quicker to develop. So logic like this is required. If you're in a multi-entity setup with multiple companies under, the, under GP, you'd want to put these, this logic in all those companies as well. So then we think about grouping within the segments, right? And, and you know, sometimes we see this, this sort of thing. Where segment one is the natural, segment two is the division, and segment three is the department. And I sometimes say to people, you know, divisions, if departments roll into divisions, why do we need a segment for division? Like, I just know natively I can group them. So, for instance, I could create a division segment called 100 and say, that's G&A. And then in the third segment, I can say, okay, now we have departments, 100, 110, 120. But why? Why wouldn't I just reserve the 100 series for G&A? Then when I do my roll-ups in Management Reporter, I can say, you know what, anytime I want to look at the division, just grab every department that starts with one, I think use one star uh, in, in Management Reporter, and that's going to group up the one series. It also makes it easier if, if departments move around. If, if all of a sudden you've got responsibility center managers on top of these, then you know when you're trees in Management Reporter, you can just simply assign departments to them. So I think it's really important to think about grouping within the segments and thinking about segment structure is like reserving numbers for department. Reserve numbers in them. Say the one series is G&A, the two series is sales and marketing, stuff like that. All right. Uh, when we talk about how we actually make this happen, there are tools out there that you can use to restructure your chart of accounts. And honestly, it's not... Uh, it's not necessarily this over-the-top complex process to go in once you've figured out the vision of what you want to do. It's actually a fairly straightforward process to, to clean up the GL. The one thing to consider, of course, is that if you restructure the GL, restructure the chart of accounts, all of your management reporter reports are going to need to be updated. They're not going to work following the restructure. Um, I also think when you go through this exercise, you need to pick a point in time when you do it where, you know, hey, it's the end of the week, you're going to take down the system over the weekend, you're going to run the process to update it, you're going to come in on Monday and check it out, make sure it all reconciles. 
you know, you're going to take a backup before you do it. So you got to engage your IT folks a little bit in this. You got to plan for it. It's not a major project, but it does need to be planned carefully. And there are tools out there to facilitate uh, the changing and the restructuring of the GL. Certainly for us, Changer, uh, it's a product CRG developed and has sold for many, many years in the GP channel. It's the tried, true, trusted uh, product for changing the GL structure. I think over 5,000 customers around the world are using it. And, and what it does is in one process, it allows you to change and merge the accounts. So when we, to be very specific, uh, you could have uh, an Excel list uh, of accounts that are your current accounts sort of in column A and in column B what you want the new account number to be and you can just upload that into Changer and run the process and it spirals through history and changes every in instance of the old account that it sees to the new account that's listed there. And this is a very powerful tool because it's actually changing the account numbers and merging data in the same process. Okay, The fact that Changer allows you to break down the changes into batches, it has an audit trail on it, you can import your list from Excel, so you can run a smart list, as I said, make the changes and import it. It makes it really easy to do. I've used it uh, many, many, many times over the last 15, 16 years, and I can tell you it never has failed. It's an excellent tool. It's very, very quick. Um, it's efficient. It has the audit trail, which is extremely important when you do this. Your auditors, of course, are going to want that uh, because when they come in to do their working papers at the end of the year, they're going to need to update their, uh, their account list. So they'll want to know what went to what and what changed. Uh, so Changer is an in incredibly powerful tool for doing that. By the way, Changer also allows you to change things like customer codes and vendor codes, employee codes, inventory codes. So certainly if you're not familiar with Changer, take a good look at it. Uh, it's the primary tool. Along with Changer, it's important to point out that we also developed Reformatter. And Reformatter comes into play if your account structure is locked. Let's say you've locked it at 12 characters, but your new structure demands 15 characters. Then you're going to need Reformatter to unlock the structure. And basically, Reformatter goes hand in hand with Changer. You'd run Reformatter, unlock the structure, which would give you more characters, and then you'd run Changer, which would populate all the new characters you've created so, uh, and segments in that new structure. So Reformatter, it's not always needed. It will only be needed if, if you look at your segment list and, and your segment structure in GP and you say, gee, it's been locked down to X number of, of characters, but we need more, then you're going to need Reformatter. And analytical accounting tools is something we developed in 2008 when analytical accounting came out. We were really excited about it. We thought it, it opened the door to tremendous flexibility on the GL side and GP. And we developed a series of tools for analytical accounting that, um, you know, really facilitate using it. There's an analytical accounting changer. Uh, that's important. If you've been using AA for a while and you want to merge some analytical accounting dimensions together, you could do that or renumber them or rename them. Uh, it allows you to do that. Another important tool, we have a history converter for analytical accounting. So if you're going through this GL change and you're thinking of moving some of the, some of the information that in the past was stored in a hard-coded segment and you want to move that to analytical accounting, our analytical accounting history changer will actually allow you to go in and, and you know, migrate the history from the segment into analytical accounting, it sort of replicates it in analytical accounting. And then you'd run Changer to get rid of the, the underlying segment. So now you're left with a smaller, tighter GL structure, but you haven't lost anything because the history against those segments you got rid of are all sitting in analytical accounting. So certainly check out these tools. There's free trials there. Of course, you can try it with, uh, with Fabricam uh, on our website at crgroup.com slash GP add-ons. And lastly, I'll just explain that sometimes this does come up. Company Combiner is a very, very popular tool we've developed over uh, a number of years ago, and very uh, lots of companies, lots of companies, very interested in it. Company Combiner allows us to combine multiple GP companies into one entity. Okay, so we sort of the only caveat here is that the companies you're combining need to have the same functional currency. But if you've seen a situation or you're living in a situation where I've got all these GP companies, and boy, oh boy, it's getting painful. I'm having to run, you know, fixed asset depreciation and multi-currency reval month-end, you know, routines over and over the same time. I mean, we've got one right now we're working with who's got over 60 companies, and they're going to combine them into three. 
right? So it's a very powerful tool, and we'd be happy to talk to you about it. It may come up because sometimes when you're thinking about chart of accounts change, it's because of consolidation, and the underlying issue could actually be we just have so many companies. We need to combine some of them. And um, and we've got a we've got a methodology for doing this, so certainly contact us if you're interested in that or you're in that situation. So I think lastly, we'll just check here to see if any questions have come in during the presentation. And um, I think we've got a few questions here, so let me let me just deal with these questions. Um, first of all, uh, one of the questions that came in. Is the is 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 there a problem in GP if you go beyond six segments? The answer to that question is no. There is no pro. I recommended six maximum here, but and honestly, the I, I do believe that the that the average number for most clients is three to four. There's no problem going beyond six. You can do it. As I said, I've worked with a client who used all ten segments before. This the product will work. The issue will simply be when you're coding transactions. Do the people doing the coding understand the structure and how long does it take them to figure out what 10 segments I need for this particular journal entry it's just the time it takes it's just it becomes inefficient when it's that big that's the only reason for that comment um, another comment comes in about analytical accounting is it just alphanumeric are there other analytical accounting types that could be useful and the answer to that question is yes analytical accounting has multiple data tracking types available. When you set up analytical accounting and dimensions, you can set them up as alphanumeric. You can set them up as a date, so people enter a date. You can enter, set them up as a yes, no question, so they just put a check mark in it. Or you can also set it up so they have to enter a quantity. So those are all useful and potentially come into this. However, from a management reporting perspective, Management reporter only recognizes the alphanumeric transaction type, okay? So just be aware of that when you're looking at analytical accounting. Another question, I think the last one here is, how long does a change your routine take to run? So to answer that question, it actually depends a little bit on the number of GL accounts that go into it, and obviously the processing time on the server will depend on the amount of data that we're changing. I've run uh, the biggest, the biggest, the best scenario I have. It's probably like 12 years ago. It was a hospital in Florida. We ran a changer exercise from 24,000 GL accounts into one, and we kicked it off overnight. And I think it was done in like six hours, and that was probably changing six or eight years of history. So um, this is why. Uh, it, it was really easy for us to do that. It's an efficient product that works really well. So I think that's got it for questions. And last thing is who wins the Amazon gift card? And the winner is Yvonne Gingrich. So Yvonne, congratulations. We're going to reach out to you with that Amazon gift card. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. If you have questions or comments on anything you've seen here, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. You can get me at jsmith at crgroup.com. I hope today's presentation was useful, um, and uh, I wish you luck on uh, the restructure of your chart of accounts and, and making the ultimate GL in Dynamics GP. Thanks very much, and have a great day. Bye-bye.